Well, this comes out of various government consultations uh, about the concern about prevalence of sexual harassment in the workplace. So what's been proposed is that, is that there'll be a new mandatory duty on employers to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. Now, an incident of harassment will still need to occur for a claim to arise, and the right will still be enforced by individuals. Uh, now, an employer can defend such a claim by right. citing that they've taken all reasonable steps to prevent harassment from occurring in the first place. So our message for employers is to think about if you were unfortunate enough to be on the end of a claim that sexual harassment took place in your workplace, what would you point to to say that we took all reasonable steps to prevent harassment occurring in the first place? So starting point, you'd think of policies, you might think of training as well, but just be aware that there was a case reported last year uh, regarding race discrimination, but the principle applies that the employer pointed to uh, equality training they'd carried out just two years previous, but the tribunal said that that wasn't good enough, the training had effectively gone stale, people had forgotten about it, and more should have been done. So policies and training are a good starting place, but employers need to think further about what they can say they've taken to prevent harassment occurring in the workplace. So non-disclosure agreements are sometimes referred to in the media as NDAs. So there was a concern that where a settlement is reached regarding complaints of bullying, harassment, particularly sexual harassment in the workplace, that NDAs were being abused. Uh, and the uh, concern was that the provisions of some NDAs uh, prohibited the employee uh, from disclosing what had happened uh, to, in the extreme, to the police, where in some cases harassment can be a criminal offence, um, to their doctors or, or counsellors uh, and to their future employer when perhaps explaining when they left their previous job. So this was seen to be an, an abuse of NDAs and the government proposes to legislate during 2022 to introduce some curbs on the use of NDAs in employment settlement agreements and also employment contracts. NDAs are not going to be outlawed altogether. There are going to be some curbs on their use introduced, uh, including making such clauses void that prevent the employee from disclosing their complaint of harassment or bullying to um, their medical professionals, to their lawyers, to, H, uh, to the police or to a future employer. So our message for employers then is that it's important to review any template assessment agreement you might use as well as your employment contracts to reassess the NDA and confidentiality provisions uh, to check that they won't fall foul of these new rights. And this is expected to be part of an employment bill, long awaited, that subject to parliamentary time will come into play this year. So there's a concern that um, women on maternity leave and returning from maternity leave are often unfairly uh, singled out for redundancy. Now there's currently uh, an existing provision that says that if a woman on maternity leave is at risk of redundancy, then if there's an alternative role available, they are to be offered that alternative role in preference to anybody else in the organisation who is at risk of redundancy. So the proposal is to expand this period of protection so it applies from when the employee notifies her employer of the pregnancy until six months after the end of her maternity leave. And this doesn't mean that employers cannot make someone on maternity leave redundant. Uh, it just means that, that if they are at risk of redundancy, they must be offered any suitable alternative role in preference to anybody else. Uh, there are a few, few quirks to be ironed out before this is brought into law. Um, and amongst other things, it's not going to apply to paternity leave, which is normally just for a couple of weeks, uh, but it will also apply to uh, those who are on adoption leave. A right to disconnect refers to an employee's right to be able to disengage from work outside of their normal working hours. So this would include disconnecting from emails, telephone calls and other relate work related tasks. Uh, the European Parliament voted to introduce uh, a right for employees to disconnect outside of normal working hours. There's no firm proposals in the UK to introduce this. Uh, however, Ireland gave it a go last year, 2021, and they granted the right to disconnect under a new official code of practice. And the three core provisions were, number one, a right not to have to routinely perform work outside their normal working hours. Number two, the right not to be penalised for refusing to attend work matters outside of normal working hours and number three 
the duty to respect another person's right to disconnect. Now, the right to disconnect is not going to work for all employers. There will be certain sectors or roles where this, where this just doesn't apply. Um, but all employers should be alive to the risk of burnout amongst employees. And this includes looking out, for, looking out for those more typical signs of burnout or overwork, such as reduced performance, tiredness, somebody not taking all their holiday, uh, excessive absenteeism, or flip side, excessive presenteeism. So we wait to see how this, how this develops and whether there's going to be any UK-wide proposal to implement the right to disconnect. But in the meantime, employers should be wary of their duty to provide a safe working environment for employees and to be on the, alive to the risk of burnout.